I am grateful that you are all here, and I am grateful that we can worship God together. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. Please listen for the word of God. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness and into his amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Your God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was just seven years old, my parents got cable television for the first time, and I was ushered into a whole new world. No longer were cartoons only for Saturday mornings. If I wanted to, and if my parents just were tired of me, I could, in theory, watch cartoons around the clock. Uh, the Disney Channel, Cartoon Network, and then there was my personal favorite channel, Nickelodeon. There was a cartoon on Nickelodeon when I was growing up. It was called Hey Arnold. Hey Arnold was a very simple program about an elementary school age boy and his friends, and it was one of my favorite programs. One episode stands out to me. In the episode, there was a redheaded boy by the name of Eugene, and Eugene in this episode meets a real-life superhero, the Abdicator. What a great superhero name, the Abdicator. So Eugene meets the Abdicator, and he expects the Abdicator to be exactly as he is on TV. And then as Eugene gets closer to the Abdicator, he realizes that this man is a fraud. He's not super. He's not even nice. It's an episode about disappointment. About the people that we look up to and how they can fail us. And it's a lesson I learned for the first time at seven years old. I'm lucky I didn't learn it sooner. A lot of us do. I love a good cartoon that isn't afraid to get to the heart of things. A cartoon that can handle delicate topics in a way that works even for children. And what could be more delicate than the people that we look up to? Parents, friends, heroes, celebrities, politicians. Here's a cartoon that taught a generation that even your heroes can sometimes hurt you. And it warned young children like me to be careful who you look up to and that even if you are careful, you still may get hurt. It told us to watch out, but it did not answer the question of what do you do when the people you look up to fail you? And what do you do when your leaders fail you? Back in the Old Testament, the small nation of Israel was tired of getting hurt by their leaders. They were tired of being treated unfairly. They expected God to do something. They expected a Messiah to deliver them. They were tired of waiting, and they wanted God to take matters into God's own hands. And so that is exactly what God did. God created a system where there was one king appointed by God and one prophet appointed by God. The king would rule with power, and the prophet would speak truth to power. There were checks and balances. And so God appointed kings like Solomon and Saul and David to rule the land and to be the agent of God's love and God's grace and God's strength and God's glory. They were to rule Israel with power and wisdom in a way that would make God proud. God searched the land for the absolute perfect leaders, and God gave those leaders the throne. Only they weren't so perfect, were they? Solomon had thousands of wives and concubines. 
Saul directly disobeyed God by offering sacrifices he wasn't supposed to. Other kings just completely fall on their faces. And then you have David. Beautiful, strong, noble David. A man with dozens of psalms dedicated to his name. A man with even modern songs written about him, a man who played a secret chord, hallelujah, Israel's greatest king. Boy, was he broken. I love that Leonard Cohen song about David, hallelujah. The song has a few misconceptions, though. It's not just some lovely song about worshiping God. It is also about a man, David, who falters. When he sees a married woman naked in the moonlight and who takes that woman as his own, fathers her child, and who has her husband killed to try and cover it up. It's right there in the second verse of that beautiful song, and it is there in the middle of Scripture with David and Bathsheba and Uriah, the great King David, Israel's most wonderful, perfect leader, a person after God's own heart, but at times a mess of a man. God knew that the leaders would mess up, and so God gave us prophets as well. The kings in Israel ruled the land, and the prophets checked the kings. The prophets spoke truth to power. They told the kings when they messed up, and the kings messed up all the time. In the scripture that Doug read earlier, the prophet Nathan did exactly that checked David. He spoke on God's behalf, delivered God's verdict on what David had done with Bathsheba and Uriah, and God was not pleased. God punished King David because the king in Scripture and anywhere else, the king will never be above God's law. Never. David does repent, but there are still consequences, and this remains a tragic chapter in David's life. And so it leads us today to one question. In a world where any one person is liable to fail us, why look up to people? In a world where any one person is liable to fail us, does this system work of looking up to people? One king, one prophet, specific people with specific tasks, a concentration of God-ordained power. Does it work? David's lineage continues to rule for 400 years. God continues faithfully with the system of one prophet and one king, one ruling, the other speaking truth to power. God tries to make this system work. It doesn't work. The leaders fail, they're not perfect. The leaders in Scripture are not perfect. And the leaders today are not perfect either. Joe Biden isn't perfect. Donald Trump isn't perfect. Your church leaders aren't perfect either. I'm definitely not perfect. Doug isn't perfect either. Nobody here today is perfect. What's the saying? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. I would not go that far. But I would say that the more powerful someone is, the greater the magnifying glass. And also the greater the imperfections. The more you notice the wrinkles in their skin and the bags underneath their eyes, the cracks in their hearts, the fissures of their character, you notice their brokenness real quick. It seems like whenever a president leaves office, you get a before and after shot in the newspapers or on the news, and you notice their thinning hair and how their coloring has changed, how much they've aged. You've noticed the stress of the job just worn on their face. That magnifying glass sometimes picks up on things that aren't too pretty, like David and his adultery. Like David ordering a hit to cover it up. This was the best leader God could find? This is our role model? I bet a lot of you can think back to a time that a leader has failed you. I bet a lot of you can think back to the first time 
a leader has failed you or a role model has failed you. That story of the abdicator hits hard because it's true. Parents, heroes, church folk, even good friends disappoint sometimes. When Lisette and I lived in Princeton, we occasionally took the subway into New York City, and I grew up playing a lot of basketball. I'm a big basketball fan. I watched the playoffs way too late last night. Uh, I always wanted to go into Madison Square Garden. It had always been a childhood dream of mine. And so when we went into New York, it just so happened that one time I was able to go into the garden during my second year of seminary, not for a basketball game, though. This was for a comedy show. The tickets were the right price, and the comedian was someone who I really, really liked, and so we jumped on it. This was a comedian who was both funny and smart, and he seemed to have a real socially conscious spine behind his material. We were excited, and so we exited the train station, and the garden was right there, and the garden was amazing. It's Madison Square Garden. The comedian was excellent. If you are the type of comedian who can sell out Madison Square Garden, you're probably pretty funny. We had a great time. About six months after the show, the comedian was canceled. Hard. Part of the Me Too movement, and he deserved it. It really shook me because even now, I can never think back to that night. That special night under the dim lights of Madison Square Garden. Without thinking about who it was, we were cheering on and who we were laughing with. Friends, when you look up to a figurehead other than Jesus Christ, that person will disappoint you. It doesn't matter if it's a comedian or a professional singer or an athlete or a parent or a child or an older kid at school. It doesn't matter if it's a pastor or the president of the United States. Eventually, that person will disappoint you. Role models tend to find a way eventually. On Pentecost, God changes the dichotomy. No longer are we looking up to one king, one person. No longer are we looking up, but instead we are able to look out. I will explain. God knows that there is no one perfect leader. We've been through this already. The kings, the role models, even religious leaders do not always point the right way. God knows that there is only one person that we can turn to with any sort of certainty, and that one person is God. It's Jesus Christ. Only at this point in Scripture, Jesus has ascended, and God is hard to see tangibly. So then who can we turn to if we can't see Jesus? On Pentecost, God answers this question. Let me set the scene. The people are gathered, worshiping, and suddenly they hear a sound from up above, a sound from heaven like a fierce hurricane-strength wind, and tongues of fire come down from heaven and rest upon each person, and each person hears God's voice spoken directly to them, audibly in their native language, their own tongue, thousands of people, and they all believe and they begin to worship and witness the presence of God. They are filled with the presence of God. What a trippy, strange, horrifying, beautiful scene. The Holy Spirit, God, comes down from heaven and rests upon each person, speaks to each person. The Holy Spirit comes down from heaven. Jesus Christ, the one perfect model that we have, came down from heaven the same way. The Holy Spirit comes down from heaven just like Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes down and out. And then the Holy Spirit rests on the shoulders of each person. And the Holy Spirit enters the hearts of each person there on Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit continues to rest on the shoulders and enter the hearts of each person here today. 
giving birth to a new community, organized not upward, but looking out. God is no longer only up there, out of reach, in a castle with one king, one person, but now God is amongst the people, with the people, in the people. God is where God belongs and where God has always belonged, not present with one king, but with all of us and in all of us. Friends, who can we turn to? The answer is still the same. It's still God. It's still Jesus. But now through the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ is with every single one of us. So do not set your sights only up, but also out. We can each look out to a great cloud of witnesses, a holy community, God in each one of us wherever we turn Friends, when you leave here today, whoever you encounter holds with them the presence and the image of God. No matter if they went to church or not, no matter what language they speak, no matter how old they are or how young they are, female, male, white, black, vaccinated, unvaccinated, each person holds within them the image and the presence of God. With the right eyes, you will begin to see God all around you, in and out of the church, in the beach, in the park, the people you pass by on the street, the people next to you in the pews. And you take all of these people and you put them together and you look at the beauty and the diversity and you realize you are looking at the body of Christ. Friends, right now I am looking at the body of Christ. And I am looking out. Pluck any one person from the body, and you'll still notice those imperfections. Look up to that person instead of out, and you may pick up on some things you don't like. But together, as the body of Christ, we are strong. Each one of us was created fearfully and wonderfully, beautifully and equally and carefully, all in God's image, with voices and hearts and brains, strengths and weaknesses, each one of us alone horribly imperfect, but together the body of Christ. Friends, when your leaders fail you, when your country fails you, When your friends fail you, when your family fails you, turn to the body of Christ, to the community of witnesses, broken witnesses made whole together like pieces in God's puzzle. When people fail you most, God asks not that you retreat inward, but that you embrace community and dive deeply into community. God's community, healthy community, holy community, and God asks that you allow that community to hold you and support you and to work on you and make you whole. God asks that you treat this community as if it houses the very presence of God because it absolutely does. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for this community, for this cloud of witnesses. We ask that each one of us here today sees your presence in the people they agree with, and that they also see your presence in the people we disagree with. We ask that we see your image everywhere we turn, And that we realize that through you and through your Holy Spirit, we are never alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now, friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community brought forth by the Holy Spirit be with you all and give you peace this day and every day forevermore. Amen.